And uh, we're glad, delighted as well, to be able to uh, join with Chris and uh, celebrate and to thank God for his work, uh, for God's work in his life, um, as he stands to confess uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord of his life, uh, and, uh, and to receive the comfort and the assurance that, that baptism brings as a means of grace to remind us of what God has done uh, in our hearts. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, I'm sure that we're all well aware that the, the water doesn't change, Chris. Uh, he's not doing this in order to win points with God, but he's doing it uh, because he wants to confess uh, Christ openly as his Lord and Savior and, and to show in a, a picture, really, a, a symbolic picture of what has happened in Chris's heart and life, that his sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus and, and, Christ, and that uh, Christ is Lord of his life. He's died to the person that he once was, and now he's alive with, with Christ. And, and that's what's really happening uh, here today. So a very warm welcome to your family and uh, friends that are here as well. Yeah, I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to be at the curry evening last night. I've already sent an apology, Bob, last night, but, but I uh, would love to. I actually did have a curry. Uh, it's quite a bit to it. Ruth is away. Um, Ruth's sorry that she's not able to be here. She's down uh, in these early days uh, this weekend looking after uh, helping Becky with the twins. And uh, so I discovered there's quite a bit to it, actually. It took 25 minutes in the oven. Yeah, so I did have a curry, but not quite the same standard. I think mine was from Lidl or Aldi, um, if you can mention the two words in the same sentence. Let's turn to um, Titus chapter 2. So Titus chapter 2. Now, you know, this may sound fairly obvious, but I think one of the reasons why some people never go to church, is this too obvious, is simply because people don't think that the Christian message is going to do them any good. Uh, I think it may be just as simple as that. They're not sure that the Christian message will help them, uh, and therefore they don't see any point. What's the point in going to, to church? Uh, they may not necessarily have rejected Jesus Christ, uh, but it may be that they've never truly heard or understood the good news, of how good the good news of the gospel is. So this morning, all I want to do is, perhaps a little bit briefer than, than normal, is to explain the Christian message and to explain what the gospel is, is all about, what the Christian message is all about. Let me read again the words in verses 11 to 14 in Titus chapter 2. Verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous, for good works. So what is the gospel all about? What is the Christian message all about? Well, three things. First of all, the gospel is all about God's grace. The gospel is all about God's grace. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to, to all men. But what on earth do we mean by grace? I don't know what kind of Images come to your mind when we talk about grace, maybe a, uh, a swan gracefully gliding across a lake or, or the sound of Yo-Yo Ma playing the cello, if you know who Yo-Yo Ma is. But although that kind of does come to mind, it's not what the Bible means when it talks about grace. Because when the Bible talks about grace, it's speaking of God's undeserved kindness, not simply his kindness towards those who don't deserve it, but his kindness towards those who actually deserve quite the opposite of his kindness, his judgment, actually, rather than his kindness. 
You know, the Bible uses many stories. There are, we could spend a very long time looking at various stories. Think of the life of Joseph, for example, in the Old Testament, or the way in which God dealt so graciously with people like um, Rahab the harlot, or the, the woman at the well, or, or, or all kinds of uh, situations in Scripture that illustrate the, the grace, the undeserved kindness of God. But here in verse 11, we read that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now, I, that seems really strange, doesn't it? We're told that grace has appeared. And according to the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter to Titus, he's not, just, he's not talking about a concept. Uh, he's not talking about an idea or a philosophy, but he's talking about a person. The grace of God has appeared, and this grace has appeared in a person, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The word appeared could literally be translated as shone forth. So in the light, in the, in the darkness of a very dark world, in this very dark world, the light of God has appeared in the person of his own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, this is how the same Apostle Paul puts it when he writes to the Philippians. He says that he humbled himself, came to this earth, the Son of God, who is without beginning and without end. He is eternally worshipped and adored by a, a myriad, a multitude of angels that cannot be counted. And he came to this earth, took upon himself human flesh, but also took upon himself the form of a servant in order to serve his God and Father, to save guilty men and women, boys and girls, children, uh, people like us. And to do that, he went all the way to the cross, nailed to the cross, died upon a cross, suffered death, even the death of the cross. Well, I wonder whether you've never heard that. I wonder whether maybe you've grown up hearing it frequently, but it's never really touched your heart. I wonder whether you know this morning the grace in the gospel. Do you know that this grace is to be found in none other than the Lord Jesus Christ? And that the King of heaven, the creator of the universe, the one who scattered stars into space, stepped down out of heaven, became a baby and came to us bringing the grace of God. Now, it seems to me that that's where so many people make the mistake of thinking that Christianity is just another religion, that it's, it's men and women's attempt to reach up to God, uh, to try and be good enough to climb the ladder of self-effort, to try and climb a few more rungs up the ladder towards God. And yet Paul says that the grace of God has appeared, come down, that God has come in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that it's not about religion, it's not about class or creed or color or culture. The grace of God has appeared to all people. That doesn't mean that all people will be okay when they die. It doesn't mean that all people will be okay, will be fine with God when they, their lives end. It doesn't, mean that, it doesn't mean that all people will be saved universally. It doesn't mean everyone will go to heaven, but only those who receive the Lord Jesus Christ personally as Lord and Savior and who bow their knees and humble their pride and enter through a, a narrow gate and onto a narrow way will be right with God. And that's why the gospel must be preached to the ends of the earth, because there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other saviour. There is no other way to get right with God. Christ must be proclaimed because he is the only hope for men and women and boys and girls. There is no other way to find peace with a God who is holy, 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 but here is the really good news that for all of us, the gospel is all about God's undeserved, abundant, unbelievably good news about God's grace. So that's the first thing that he says, the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, it's, it's the gospel of God's grace. 
But secondly, notice that the gospel is all about God's power. God's power as well. The Lord Jesus appeared not to bring some new ideas or philosophy or religion, but in order to change people's lives for all eternity. People like Chris Savage. It may seem very hard to believe in our 21st century world. You might ask, well, how, how can Christianity, how can this message, 2,000 years old, how can it be relevant to men and women today? The world is changing so fast. I mean, even COVID has reminded us of that, of how rapidly the world changes. But you know, the gospel is always relevant because circumstances may change, technology may change, the world may change in a thousand ways, whether it's because of COVID or something else. But the reality is the human heart never changes. And that is why the Bible is the most up-to-date book in the world. It is the most contemporary message that you can ever hear because it applies throughout the whole of history to every human heart. That's why it's so relevant. Now, Paul is writing this letter to a church leader called Titus. He's on the island of Crete. He's there because the Christian message is spreading very rapidly. Many people are becoming Christians. But, you know, there was a proverb. He tells us in this letter that there was a proverb that was spoken about the people of Crete. They're always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. That's not very nice, is it? Always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Their children grew up learning to lie. It was in their blood. Actually, it's really interesting. A few years ago, I went to the uh, Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, and um, and I, I, I discovered that there was a, um, a cabinet, a big glass cabinet. There's a display of artifacts, uh, items that they've that the archaeologists have found on Crete. And quite interesting, because the most significant thing there, the most prominent thing amongst all of the artifacts, is, is various articles all connected with food, foody things. Because it said, this is, you know, these are not necessarily Christians who are doing this display, but they are quite clearly stating it's because of their obsession with food. I think it confirms exactly what Paul is saying here about the people of Crete. Obsessed. Always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And so Paul has sent Titus to appoint church leaders, young church leaders, probably not being Christians all that long, but, but you know, he, he is to appoint men as leaders of the churches that are being planted, and there are to be men who are different in a culture like Crete, with its lies and its spin and its double standards, I mean, quite unlike today, of course, but a world of spin and of lies, an, an unhealthy, un, uh, unpalatable kind of world, despite their obsession with food. The leaders of the church were to be of the churches were to be men whose lives had been radically transformed, men of integrity. Men in whom there was no credibility gap between what they said and how they lived, what they were in public and what they were in private. And the point is that Titus is able, that's the point, he's able to appoint such men because this is what the gospel had done to such people, had transformed their lives completely. It's the power of grace to transform lives. There's a, a, a well-known German philosopher called Friedrich Nietzsche, who, uh, as a young man, he, he once said, interestingly, if ever I am to become a Christian, Christians are going to need to look a lot more like Jesus Christ. Well, Friedrich Nietzsche actually became a terrible opponent of the Christian faith. But in Crete, you see, all kinds of people were becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. You see that here in chapter 2. That's why I wanted the earlier part. You may have wondered, why are we reading the whole of this chapter? 
Well, it's for this reason, because of the kind of people that you see mentioned here. Young and old, slave and free, rich and poor, men and women, educated and uneducated. Every class, culture, creed. And the problem is, you see, is that we all need to be changed. We're all enslaved, says the Apostle Paul. The gospel has appeared to all men, but have you received him? Have you? Do you know this power at work changing and transforming your life? That's why the gospel actually makes people very uncomfortable. Maybe that's the reason why some people don't want to hear the gospel, because they don't like the fact that it makes them distinctly uncomfortable when they do hear the gospel. You know, we struggle with that generally in our society. We feel that... Um, you know, that we have the rights to our own privacy. Uh, we don't like our privacy being invaded. We like to keep ourselves to ourselves. Uh, we barely talk. We hardly talk to our... Uh, maybe, maybe you hardly know your, your, ne your next-door neighbours. I don't know. Um, next-door neighbours hardly speak to one another in the places where we live. So that when we do get really up close and personal and admit our need to... Us and recognise our need to admit... Uh, our, our sin and to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, that kind of uh, up close and personal message is distinctly uncomfortable in our age. Maybe you're sitting there right now feeling distinctly uncomfortable. If you've never been made to feel uncomfortable with the gospel, I just wonder have you ever heard the gospel? And even now, maybe as Christians, do we daily become uncomfortable at the reminder? Sometimes, perhaps. Because the gospel is not only a gospel of grace, it is a gospel that confronts our sin. It confronts us and brings us face to face with our guilt in the eyes of God. To whom all things are naked and open. You can't get more personal than that. And the point is this, we see so clearly here, the gospel is the power of God to transform your life. Isn't that? That is good news. It doesn't matter who you are, young or old, rich or poor, male or female, slave or free, Jew or Gentile, educated or not. The gospel of Christ is the power to change your life so that you actually become a new person in the sight of God so that you're transformed, you become a new creature in the sight of God. All your sins are no longer counted against you, but are laid upon Christ, who died upon the cross, and his righteous life is put to your account. And then on a daily basis, we are actually transformed in daily practice and in our lives. You see, verse 12 says that this gospel of grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, the word teaching us could be translated as disciplining us. Um, the word denying, teaching us to deny uh, ungodliness and worldly lusts, it's uh, literally, if you were to translate it, it's something that's happened in the past and completed. So, in other words, it, it, he is saying that He's not saying, look, if you stop these things, then, th then you'll become a Christian. You have some hope if you stop doing these things. This is not a gospel of good works or self-help. But this is a gospel that tells us that when the Lord Jesus Christ saves us, that there is a power to transform our lives, to stop sinning, and to live godly lives. And that's why this same apostle could write to the Romans in Romans chapter 1 and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to save. It is the power of God. The word that he uses is a word from which we get the English word dynamite. This is God's dynamite to transform lives. So this is a, a message that can make you good. You don't have to be good to get it. In fact, you can't be good to get it. But it is a gospel that makes you good when you receive Christ. In fact, the gospel delivers you from three things. 
from the penalty of sin. Verse 11, the grace of God that brings salvation, that means deliverance from judgment, from hell, from judgment upon our sins. The grace of God delivers us from the penalty of our sins. It delivers us from the power of our sin. Verse 12, all these passions and habits that constrain us and enslave us and control us, so that we then look, so that we're able to look with great anticipation and joy for the blessed appearing of Jesus when he comes again. And this gospel will deliver you from the very presence of sin. It is ultimately will deliver you from the very presence of sin. Not immediately, but in our daily lives, he transforms us until that glorious day when we see him face to face and when sin is no more. So the gospel then deals with your past, it deals with your present problems, it deals with your future prospects. It is a transforming thing. So that Paul can say that after you're converted, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new because of this new birth that you experience through the Lord Jesus Christ. But thirdly, I must really bring this to a close, but thirdly, you notice this. The gospel is all about God's grace. The gospel is all about God's power. But then thirdly, and finally, the gospel is all about God's Son, Jesus. How is such a change possible? Well, the answer is found in verse 14. Our great God and Saviour. It's because of our great God and Saviour. And by the way, he's not saying our great God and our Saviour, but our great God who is our Saviour. Our Saviour who also is God made flesh, Jesus. It's possible because of the key word here, which is to redeem. He, He came into this world in order to redeem us. I'm sure that We're all aware of what redemption means, and you're able to, even these days, you can redeem something. Uh, You can redeem something online, can't you? Uh, But it means, essentially, that he pays the price. He himself pays the price to buy us back, to redeem us. He can't just turn a blind eye. It's not that the gospel says that God sort of sweeps our sin under the carpet, or that he turns a blind eye. In fact, he is of pure eyes and to look upon sin, but he can't turn a blind eye to our sin. Our sin must be judged. There must be payment. There must be justice. I'm so thankful that God is a just God. Wouldn't it be an awful thing if we thought that there was no judgment for the, for the Adolf Hitlers and, and, and the, uh, whatever, Jimmy Savills of this world? But he is a just God. He must deal with sin in order to be just and righteous. And he gave his son Jesus to pay the ransom price because there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. And there, hanging between heaven and earth, he paid with the currency of his own blood, the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish and without spot. And we we may not know, we cannot tell what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for you and me that he hung and suffered there upon the cross and gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world and that he might have a people who are increasingly like Jesus, uh, people who are zealous for good works for himself. Now, you know, as we close, maybe someone is thinking, do you know, I would, love to, I, would love, I would love that. I would love to know the truth of that in my heart. I would long to be a person like that, a person who no longer lives for sin, and no longer, no longer a person who lives for the habits, the addictions that enslave me. Would you wish, would you want to live righteously for God in this present evil world with its temptations that increasingly seem to be more obvious than ever? Well, if so, the answer was really, really simple. The message of the gospel is really simple. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, just like you and me. And our response is to welcome Jesus, to take hold of him as he is freely offered to us. In the gospel, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, trying to do it yourself. Come unto me, 
If any man, if any man or woman thirsts, let them come unto me and drink. Come to Jesus. And there is a warning here in this passage that there was a first appearing, but we're reminded that there will be a second appearing. Who knows when? And if you don't have Christ who came in his first appearing, then you won't have him when you see him when he comes again. You won't be right with him when he comes. You, you won't be right with him when, when you see him when he comes again. Do you know, this is the third Sunday in a row when we've baptized somebody, and each story has been incredibly different. Each one just as significant as the other, each one just as, as much a miracle from God as the others. But, you know, the real question is, what about you? What about you? This really is a gospel of grace, amazing grace, the grace of God, the power of God. And it's all about the Son of God. And the question that remains that will... That that is hanging in the air, the question that's left hanging for you this morning is, what about you? Do you know the grace of God in this person, Jesus? And if not, why not today? Why not now?